to our Friday night uh, sort of chats that we've been doing um, on various menswear topics. Um, this evening, we uh, are joined by Mark Hutter, um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about wrapping gowns and banyans. Um, essentially, uh, and I'm sure Mark will cover this, uh, you know, what is a wrapping gown? What is a banyan? Are there differences? Are there regional differences? Um, Probably get into a little bit, Mark. Uh, what types of fabrics? You know, that, as we discussed earlier today, you know that's um, you, you have a lot of choice there. Um, who are wearing these? When? When are they wearing? You know, when is it appropriate for an individual? You know, for a guy uh, to be wearing one of these? Again, I think a lot of folks will probably find that pretty interesting too. I think we we tend to sort of narrowly focus these in in the home, but not not always the case. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, what are these garments that we see so frequently portraited? Um, you know, who's wearing them? Why? Who, what, where, when, and why of all of this? Um, so I think Mark has um, a, a little bit of a PowerPoint here that he's going to be sharing with us. Um, or a massive PowerPoint that he'll be sharing with us. Yeah, a little bit, little bit might be a, an understatement. All right. Well, you gotta, you, you, we got an hour. <laughs> um, but uh, what we'll do is we'll uh, let Mark um, start. Um, and um, if you guys have questions, uh, please use the, if you're, if you're watching us on Zoom, use the Q&A feature for the webinar. Uh, it just makes it easier for me to track the questions and I make sure I funnel them correctly to, to Mark. Um, and I'll try to get them as, as quickly as I can, even if I have to interrupt him. Um, and then I'll also uh, be following along on the YouTube live stream as well, um, just to make sure that if any questions pop up there, feel free to put them in the chat area. And uh, again, I'll, I'll uh, follow those up with, um, with Mark as we, as we go through um, his talk. So Mark, if you want to uh, start, uh, welcome and, um, and um, take it from there. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Neil said, feel free to jump in with questions. Please do not uh, hesitate to, to interrupt me. There's a tremendous amount of information that we could go through, but our time is, is relatively limited. Um, I thought we'd start with something pretty familiar. I think that this is a portrait that uh, almost anybody that, um, that looks at 18th century specifically or particularly American um, clothing um, is probably familiar with. Um, it's, uh, it's one of two versions of a portrait of Nicholas Boylston, a Boston merchant painted by John Smith Copley in 1767, and then a subsequent one was painted in 1769. Um, it's very broadly uh, republished, and almost every, or perhaps still, every written uh, discussion of this painting refers to the garment that he's wearing as a banyan, or perhaps more pro properly pronounced banyan, the accent being on the, the second syllable. Um, this is a, um, a confusion caused by costume historians over the course of the last couple of decades or handful of, of decades uh, um, that we have taken all forms of men's robes in the 18th century um, and called them by the same name, banyans. But it becomes readily evident when you start looking at 18th century documents that there are multiple names and multiple variations on these forms of loose robes that men, men wear. This selection of advertisements from in newspapers uh, dated uh, between about 1730 and the earliest one in 1770. Um, give us the name uh, morning gown. We will also see India gown, night gown, Asianly China uh, gown. 
Um, and especially here in North America, the term wrapping gown um, or wrapper and the odd variation of lapper uh, can all be seen. But I think the question is and should be, and I don't know that we yet have a perfect answer, is are all of these garments, um, are these multiple titles for, a, for the same garment? Are they a small group of garments? Or is each title distinct? That's what we're going to explore as we, as we look through some of uh, these images and documents uh, this evening. These advertisements also show that there's a tremendous range of textiles in which these objects uh, are made. Uh, the first advertisement in the upper left hand corner uh, here lists um, rich double ground brocades, pattern swaths, Venetians, damasks, striped and flowered loop strings. Rosettes, turkey mantuas, thread satins, scotch plaids, silk plaids, striped and flowered calamancos. Um, you'll see that several of those are, are repeated. Um, notice in the advertisement below that, fine cloth, meaning broad cloth, um, the wealth of woolen. And duffins uh, are listed. That's probably a variation on dufin um, or uh, duroy dufins. Uh, which are worsteds, uh, particularly of Norwich uh, manufacture. Um, I'll also uh, note that these garments, wrapping gowns and banyans, um, are not entirely exclusive to the masculine wardrobe. Uh, notice in the last advertisement on this page in the lower right hand corner, the mention of ladies' gowns wadded and bed gowns. Whether or not they were referring to what we commonly think of a bed gown, that shorter uh, garment worn by women often while working and not exclusively um, in this advertisement is questionable. But that's not our topic this evening. Uh, we're going to focus on the masculine usage of these informal coats um, and gowns. These two separate um, extracts are taken from the account book of William Carlin um, of Alexandria, Virginia, a tailor working there, 1763-1791. And um, these are just two examples uh, of multiple references to the making of banyans versus the making of gowns, wrappers, lappers that point out, I think, a very important distinction the making of banyans almost always includes uh, charges for such things as pockets, molds, which would be the, uh, the base of, of a button to be covered in fabric or, or thread, um, occasionally trims, tassels, froggings uh, are, are mentioned. Whereas the other garments, the gown-like garments, um, are simply a charge for fabric and, and, and labor. I think this begins to give us some uh, in indication that these, there are at least two categories that we need to be looking at. Garments that have more structure and some means of closure, pockets and buttons um, here in the, in the banyan. And then these others, gowns, that are, are without as much structure, um, don't have integral means, of, of closure. Um, and as we explore further, we'll see, of course, that there are, are more distinctions than that. The history of, of loose, informal robes um, in English culture begins well before the 18th century. In the 16th century and the 17th century, not an uncommon object in a man's wardrobe um, is a, um, a gown, sometimes referred to as a bed gown, then worn over a, a, a doublet. Um, they, they varied from being very informal um, and comfort, comforting and warm to quite formal and, and luxurious. Um, that garment is not the ancestor of the most common form of T-shaped 
garment, referred to as a wrapping gown or gown uh, through the 18th century. The T-shaped garment that we know most well, like Boylston was wearing in that initial portrait, in fact, descends of Japanese kimono or kusode. Um, through the late 16th, early 17th century, um, trade with Japan um, was, um, was available to, to Europe in a very limited uh, way. From 1613 to 1623, English merchants had a factory or trading post at Hirado, uh, Japan. Um, in, 16, um, 30, in 1623, um, that was then taken over by uh, the Dutch East India Company, um, who remained there for the next 50 some years uh, or, or so. Um, English merchants in Japan at the time um, traded for and were um, giving gifts of kimono or, or kemon, as they referred to me at the time, and kusode. Um, but the, there is little indication that they began, that the fashion in English culture began quite that, uh, that early. There's an, uh, an outstanding forthcoming article from the curator at the uh, Victoria Albert Museum, Susan North. Uh, which gives a remarkably detailed history um, of this, this trade with, uh, with Japan. Um, I will give only a rough outline uh, of it here. Mark, just not to interrupt you too much here, but uh, do you know where that's being published at? Uh, it's in Costume, uh, the journal of the British Costume Society, um, okay. and is coming out um, mid-year. Okay, great. May I'll May, June. Okay, yeah, what I'll do is I'll put a link in the description for um, uh, the Costume Society. Um, that way, folks who want to join can then have access <clears> to <throat> that. Yeah. Um, so through the, the middle part of the 17th century, it's really Holland's trade with Japan uh, that introduces the, uh, the kimono of the soda to Europe. Uh, annually, Dutch merchants uh, paid homage to the emperor and were given um, a number of kimono um, that were returned to Holland. Um, some presented to his majesty, others available in um, East India Company shops uh, in, in Amsterdam. Um, in the, those middle years, this seems to remain largely uh, Dutch and not until 1660s uh, does it seem to, to enter England. So the first examples that we're going to look at are, are Dutch. Uh, this portrait of Hartsuper by Netscher um, in the late 17th century shows what is probably a, a Japanese-made example of this um, the, the variation on the wrapping gown or the soda that was being sent to, to Europe at that point. And this example in the Rijksmuseum um, dates to about the, the same period. These are almost, at this time, are almost exclusively silk. Um, they are very often wadded with loose silk fiber through the interior, between the, uh, the exterior and the lining of the fabric, is this batting of fluffy um, silk fiber. Some of them, in fact, as you can see, this example were very full and um, warm and comfortable in the, uh, the damp heat of the Dutch winter. Um, that uh, not that England is any less damp uh, in its winters. It just seems to that they seem to be available in such a limited quantity and it's so exclusive that it, it takes a remarkable couple of decades uh, before they become um, popular uh, in England. Some of the earliest references in England um, are, um, are quite well known. In 1661, um, Samuel Pepys purchased uh, a gown and had his portrait painted in it. You can probably see that, uh, that portrait. In 1640, uh, Holland 
you know, the, the Dutch East India Company moves its trading post from Hirado, Japan, uh, a bit north and lose some of their contacts. And um, the, the supply from Japan to Europe quickly diminishes. And so Dutch merchants uh, being copper um, and with new trade in India, take Japanese examples to India and begin to have them um, manufactured uh, on the Coromandel coast um, to create larger supplies, hundreds upon hundreds of Japanese-inspired uh, garments being made in India for the European market, such as this is a great example. This is from Mongol Coast, chintz, uh, painted uh, cotton and chintz, but it's painted in the style of Japanese Zen uh, textiles. And so these garments are this incredible global um, uh, And yet, that story seems quickly forgotten. By the time of the introduction to, um, to England in the 1660s, um, their Japanese origins seem to be forgotten. Um, there's no known English reference that, that uh, refers to these uh, as kimono or Japanese arm or Japanese coats, even though the Dutch sometimes use the word jump. Um, and in fact, their origins become rather confused. Um, this image on the, on the right of the screen refers to this as an Armenian uh, robe. Is it? Um, possibly. Certainly, as we see in the Causeway portrait on, on the left, um, Armenian and Turkish um, and other Caucasian individuals wear long, long robes. Perhaps some were in England. There's in fact a 1772, 1773 reference to a Moravian man in Salem, uh, North Carolina, with a caftan, um, a man named Wachog, um, with a caftan in his inventory. Is it truly a caftan or is it a Japanese inspired gown made in India? The, the story is, is too muddled uh, to, to, to separate. The, the fact that these garments um, uh, have this, this multicultural aspect um, and may in fact also be, say, of Armenian descent um, is borne out in uh, oh, I have a slide there. Uh, you'll find it. Uh, um, there's an incredible surviving garment in Maryland, um, a, a series of vows um, that was worn by an American gentleman uh, named Solomon Hill uh, on his travels in the United States. So sometimes these are in fact um, other robes of other ethnicities um, imported through Europe and into the, the colonies. Um, and yet they seem to um, all fall under the term gown. Here's another nice early uh, example. Um, so with its water, um, on Albert, and this one in our collection. Uh, it doesn't have a silk wadding, but has a wool wadding. Uh, in it. Probably more indicative of European manufacture. Uh, um, by the late 17th century, European uh, tailors are imitating these garments, uh, are probably more likely copying the Indian imitations as opposed to the Japanese uh, originals. Um, they, they are not cut in exactly the manner that a kusoto or a, a kimono was. Um, the kusoto, by the way, um, is, is T-shaped without the long hanging sleeve of a court kimono. Sometimes, sometimes referred to as um, as the winter um, they are uh, straighter sleeves, um, more logical inspiration for the garments. With 
with now multiple sources of manufacturing these garments, the variety of textiles in which they're being made certainly broadens tremendous beyond the, the Japanese silks uh, of those originals and even the Indian cottons. Uh, by the early 18th century, um, they're being made in textiles um, of European manufacture um, or other imported goods, Chinese damasks, um, European uh, damasks. Here we see two silk damasks, uh, wrapping gowns, both of them lined uh, in silks as well, um, and both of these probably of European uh, manufacture. Notice that their, their patterns tend to be very large scale, um, suitable to the, the uncut panels um, or the, the large panels uh, with a little cutting of, of the gong. It's one of the very few opportunities in, in a man's wardrobe to show off large, bold pattern uh, fabrics. Um, smaller, repetitive patterns are preferred uh, in suitings. Sometimes the fabrics um, used in wrapping gowns um, are also drawn from the feminine wardrobe or even household uh, and upholstery or fabrics that you might think of as being more usually suitable for household and upholstery um, because of their scale. Um, don't assume that the fancy fabric always goes on the outside. In the copy portrait on the left, you see damask exterior and the silk lining. But in the portrait of Isaac Newton on the right, notice that the damask is the lining and there's a point next to it as well. Is the gown reversible? Some of them are described uh, as reversible. UV Newton for his portrait decided on this day to turn it inside out. Uh, Here, um, a very large scale worsted uh, damask, the example from the Museum of Scotland, um, and a pretty large scale uh, damask in the historic New England uh, example as well. Um, these both in wool and the one in, on the right, lined in uh, wool. This was probably a wool called frieze, um, a plain woven uh, woolen with a, a napped surface um, to provide a, a great deal of warmth. Frieze has many uses um, in the 18th century. You see it from table coverings to working aprons to the linings of cloaks and great coats, um, and sometimes listed as the exterior fabric um, of, of wrapping gowns uh, as well. So now we're beginning to see, of course, that these can be suitable to a variety of, of climates. Um, they can be light, like the silk and the cotton examples. They can be um, warm, like these worsted examples. We mentioned broadcloth, we mentioned lined and, and unlined. Um, and so they, they certainly have um, multiple uh, degrees of warmth and purposes of but as we look through these images, I begin to notice as well the variety of situations, indoors, outdoors, formal, informal, private, public, um, in which these garments can be documented. Here we see um, Johann Ingram uh, in a contrived uh, classical uh, set. Oswell portrayed in this, this exterior stuff. Wrapping gowns worn out of doors? Yes, sometimes. Um, there are a couple of references to uh, the gentleman off um, the spas uh, wandering the, the city in their wrapping gowns. It became so much of fashion um, that Bo Nash had to ban them from wearing them uh, in the assembly rooms uh, there. Um, notice in these two examples, the sort of extreme work that they, they might uh, provide. Uh, Vinkelmans in velvet lined in fur that perhaps wolf, um, very full, uh, and Boswell's possibly a broadcloth uh, wrapping gown. Uh, it certainly looks much more like a wool uh, than, than a silk lined in, in fur. In fact, I believe there's a script that mentions that this is fox uh, fur. I need to double check that. This example from 
when he weighs it. It's a nice, tightly woven, hard finished uh, worsted tartan. Uh, notice there are two slightly different tartans. And I see that the sleeve on the left side of each uh, is a different set of pattern than the rest of the arm. Lined in a, a, a fairly soft kind of uh, green silk twill. We, met, we saw scotch plaids, uh, plaids uh, listed in the, uh, one of those early advertisements. Um, there are a number of references to uh, tartan and scotch plaid uh, banyans and wrapping gowns, and yet there are remarkably few examples uh, that survive. Uh, there are no known uh, broadcloth examples, to my knowledge, at this point. And a smattering of the, the worst of examples that we were looking at. I think they're much more common than what the surviving examples indicate. Um, the large quantities of fabric make them easily cut up and made into other garments. And of course, they are smorgasbords for moths and um, another vermin. So um, the likelihood of surviving, surviving is much lower. All of the examples that we've seen uh, thus far um, are of relatively similar proportion um, and length. A lot of the surviving examples are uh, somewhere in the uh, 50 to 55 uh, inch range in their length on most men of a moderate height, uh, putting it um, about ankle, uh, very low shin uh, to ankle length. But there's definitely an exception, as you can see in this Gotard cartouche uh, for the merchant tailors of, of London, uh, that the, the tailor is taking the measure, his gown uh, drapes onto the floor. There's an amazing surviving American example um, of a long gown like this, published in uh, Sharon Bernstein's um, Fitting and Proper uh, from the Chester County Historical Society. While Almost all of the examples that we've looked at this thus far uh, have been boldly patterned and colored uh, fabrics. Don't be mistaken in believing that there are very plain uh, examples as well. You can see these uh, English and American uh, portraits. Benjamin Rush on the lower left and Henry Middleton, uh, or Rush on the Plain examples, again, are almost um, unseen in the surviving um, uh, garments, um, simply because, probably because they, they are not thought of as attractive, um, and so they, um, they don't have the, the desirability of the ornate examples. So I think many of them were kept more as examples of the textile than of the garment uh, themselves. But there are some plain, uh, I think, here or two that would appear to be very plain linen. Um, fortunately, one of the simplest of surviving examples um, is that worn by George Washington in the collection of Captain Vernon. Um, it's believed that this is possibly a gown that he wore at the time of, of his death. While in the large image, it might, larger images, it might appear as though it is um, a, an unadorned garment. It is, in fact, uh, printed. Uh, it's a printed cotton. And as you can see in the, the detail, it's a, a check, but it's printed on the diagonal. So the, the check is on point on the, the fabric with blue lines running one direction and red lines running uh, the, the other. Um, there are some other um, check gowns that sur survive. Uh, there's a woven linen check gown at the University of Rhode Island, um, made in Rhode Island in the late 18th century. Um, the linen was grown, spun, and woven uh, on the, the family farm. Unfortunately, I don't have an image of that one that I can share. Um, linen gowns and banyans um, are fairly frequently mentioned. 
Czech examples are fairly mentioned. Remember the uh, the Taylor, the Carlin count that I showed very early on uh, with the, the Czech, uh, Czech linen banya uh, mentioned there. But again, extant examples are, are, are just uh, not to be found. Smaller, plainer prints are sometimes seen, um, as can be seen in, in these caricatures. Um, but bold prints, such as the exterior of this, dominate uh, over the, the simpler line, the shell line, this example uh, from the fourth element. Not all of the, the not all wrapping gowns um, are made of yardage that was printed, made into anything. Some are, um, are printed specifically to be the, the garment um, into the work. This example from the historic Deerfield was printed specifically so the pattern uh, would run down the, the sleeves. There is a join um, about um, two thirds of the way up the, the sleeve, but it's not at the intersection of the, of the design. So the printers arranged the fabric to figure out uh, the cut of the garment, printed it, and then the fabric was cut and assembled. It's essentially a, a, a wrapping gown, or uh, I should say specifically an India gown kit. Um, the border here is also um, printed uh, for most of the garment and then sewn on, uh, pieced on applique. Uh, were necessary to complete it. This is an American example uh, collected from Maine, who sit in the historic Deerfield collection, uh, but it's not the only uh, American documentation for this very um, high-end sort of, of wrapping gown. Uh, this portrait um, of William Duguid uh, uh, by the African-American artist Barnes um, was um, less than a decade. If you look really carefully, again, you'll see that the vines um, in the pattern run both up the body and up the sleeve, and yet there is no seam, uh, no arm's eye there, indicating that this is probably a uh, wrapping gown or India gown printed to shape uh, to, to be this garment. Here's another example uh, in an American collection, but not, uh, uh, but not uh, an American collection. So, um, here, the orders are all printed uh, specifically to be arranged in this final line. But borders can be added, as in this example from uh, Portland. So here, a separate textile broad zigzag border was cut and sewn to its end. Um, and you can see the, the border that really cuffs uh, the gown together. So in reproducing these objects, um, if you're careful and great, um, you can imitate uh, such examples. Like so we have one at uh, the retail shop we're going to a week uh, using two different uh, chintzes uh, from um, and uh, fairly, um, fairly, uh, I don't want to say accurately, uh, but fairly well copied the aesthetic uh, of this piece. Um, finding textiles to make such garments um, should be done with care. There are lots of of prints out there that imitate the aesthetic, but the, the design elements uh, may be um, poorly rendered. Colorways uh, often are changed to, to suit current consumer and, and decorator uh, tastes. Um, and so look at the, the abundant examples. Um, there are 
tons of, of these to be viewed on, online and really train your eye to the, uh, the aesthetic um, characteristics of, of the 18th century fabrics um, if, you, if you want to be as accurate as you can. Yeah, probably you know, a great place for that is you know, Linda Eaton's new updated book of printed textiles in America. Uh, great. Most, most of the uh, black and white images in that book that were originally published by Florence Montgomery have been updated with color photography um, and, you know, really, really good uh, resource for most folks um, to have on, uh, you know, just to have on hand. Remember, uh, they're, they're not all patterned. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the plain examples. Remember plain white linen, check linen, um, simple stripes um, are all perfectly acceptable, acceptable and are really underrepresented um, in the, the diversity of gowns and banyans that, um, that folks are out there wearing uh, currently. Um, here's an example that's not English or, or American, it's Dutch, uh, but I thought it was a, a great example to talk about the bizarre diversity of uh, textiles. Here's a textile that you're not apt to, to find um, a good reproduction of. Uh, but more importantly, this garment is a, a different cut uh, than that with which we are most familiar. If you look really carefully at the, um, the arrangement and the angle of the, the pattern elements on the body versus on the sleeve versus the body. Um, you can see that this sleeve is cut in one with the body, but it's not on a straight of green fold, as in the, the T-shaped um, wrapping gown, or um, the T-shaped Japanese-inspired India gown um, that becomes used wrap, or wrapping gown um, as well. Um, the image on the, the right of the screen is taken from the book. Um, they are referred to as a pro de chambre, or a, a, a robe for the, for the chamber. And notice that the, the sleeve is cut in one with the body with a slight slash on the underarm to which the gusset might be uh, set. But it's cut at an angle, so it slopes off of the shoulder. Notice as well that the front, um, the, which is uh, pattern element A uh, there, um, is cut the curve of the neck and it's broad enough that it can overlap. Um, it doesn't hang straight down the body. C and B are the doors. Um, G down towards the bottom of that plate is the collar um, and F is the extension for the sleeves. This style of, of robe chambre um, or gown um, survives in multiple examples on the continent, primarily uh, Dutch examples. Um, I have yet to find a, an English example um, or any American example. I don't know if, um, if this style is appropriate um, to, um, to areas outside of, of the continent. Um, I won't eliminate it. This this portrait um, of Handel by Mercier, painted in England in the 1730s, is possibly um, this, this sort of regard. The sleeve cut in one with the body, but not on the, the fold, cut with a taper, finished with a cuff, a collar overlapping. Uh, um, but as I said, to date, there are no extant examples um, that helped to document this style outside of Holland and France, according to Diderot's illustrations. It is, however, somewhat more similar to the, the nightgown, the 17th, 16th and 17th century style nightgown, um, as, as we mentioned earlier. Um, the, Diversity of, of textiles um, um, diversity of textiles uh, goes beyond 
uh, some of the, the the examples that we've discussed uh, thus far. This obviously is um, an imperial uh, Chinese dragon. There are a very couple of references that call these, call or that refer to China gowns uh, being worn in England and America. Do they mean this? Probably uh, not. Uh, but here we see a Russian example uh, of a fortune teller wearing a garment that appears to be made from a similar uh, Chinese dragon. And oops. bear that in mind. Uh, we'll we'll see another example um, shortly of uh, uh, Banyan uh, remade from a dragon robe. All of these garments uh, thus far, the gowns are open on the front and have no integral closure. Uh, to them, no, um, no attached belt um, or, uh, or buttons. Um, but they are often worn with sashes. In fact, if you recall the advertisements that we looked at very early on, uh, sashes and caps um, are listed in some of the gown warehouse and advertisements. Um, the sashes might be um, imported objects, woven um, sashes are, are used throughout uh, the Middle East and, and India. Um, and uh, at least one Dutch merchant mentions the importation of, of sashes. But some of the images appear to be sprang uh, sashes, uh, such as this sprang work example, uh, which is a military sash, um, not probably not born uh, with one uh, But uh, spring sashes are listed uh, in some of the, the London uh, advertisements. Were they adorned? Were they the plain? Uh, we, we simply don't know. Uh, but something akin to this, spring being a, um, essentially a multi-strand form of, of braiding uh, here. So these are not knit, they are not woven. Um, they, it's referred to as spring work. Here is an example that survives with its, uh, uh, its belt uh, or, or sash. Uh, this example is from Denmark, but really remarkable because it survives not only, um, not only a gown, but a matching or accompanying garment to be worn, presumably, um, that is closer, more closely fit to the body and has set in the sleeves. This is much more akin to what we currently believe banyans uh, to, to be. Remember the tailor's um, uh, receipts and um, entries in their account books that mention buttons, pockets, um, more structural objects. The mark. That's that and there lies the difference between a when we discuss a wrapping gown and a banyan. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, you no period no period source of which we're currently aware um, seems to, to make the comparison um, and and uh, explain the, the difference. Um, I don't think it needed to be explained. I think that they were distinctly different enough that there wasn't confusion uh, at the time. And it's also very important that they have two different periods and ports of entry to, uh, to European usage. Gowns enter English usage in the 1660s. It's not until about 1730 that Ban the word banyan as garment begins to appear in London advertisements. Um, the early descriptions say that, that these are coming from India as well, um, but they are not the Japanese inspired garment. They are an Indian inspired uh, garment. The 
period sources say that they take their, their name from the caste of merchant, um, Hindu merchants in, in India, referred to as the Vanya, um, which in corrupted adjective form becomes Banya. It's also, of course, the name of, of the tree uh, below which this merchant sit. Um, the Banyan um, and Jama are closely related garments in Indian culture. So here you see a Jama uh, from the Victorian Albert uh, Museum. The, the man um, in the portrait, however, is probably wearing um, what would in the 18th century uh, be referred to as a uh, as a banya uh, in India. Notice that um, they have narrow fitted sleeves, a broadly wrapping uh, front with some form of closure, tying uh, in the case of, of the Indian you know, the original, um, and generally some form of collar uh, to them. Here is, um, I apologize for uh, this. Um, this is the Kumbhas uh, the, um, um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, my purpose for uh, putting it there was to, to point out that some of these garments are in fact of, um, of Middle Eastern, um, and Indian, and Caucasian manufacture, um, some for um, indigenous use in their, um, in their places of manufacture, and some for export. Um, we have a, a, a banyan at Queen of Williamsburg, which you'll see in a little bit, which is possibly Indian manufacture for the, the Western market. Um, this, however, this kumbaz, um, is not was not made to be exported. In fact, it wasn't made for a man. Um, this is a woman's kumbaz, according to Syrian uh, scholars. Um, but we know that it was worn by Solomon Edding, um, a Jewish merchant from Baltimore, Maryland, um, after his return from traveling in, um, the, in the Holy Lands, Turkey, and um, um, and the, the Middle East um, in the very early 19th century. Uh, he returned to Maryland uh, with this garment and is recorded as having worn it. Uh, it's a patterned silk exterior lined in, in silk. Fiber. <laughs>